to be here. Um, one thing I should mention is everything I'm going to be talking about is in Drosophila or um, Melanogaster. Um, oftentimes I just assume people know that I'd be working on that because I'm often talking at the fly meeting, but this is a broader group, so just letting people know right away. Um, to me, one of the uh, interesting sort of what I would call the, an evolutionary irony is, uh, is sexual reproduction itself because what is the most, one of the more convincing reasons that sexual reproduction is maintained within populations is because it is allows through recombination, um, through recombination, so these are all sort of segregating deleterious alleles, it allows rec through recombination the recovery of morphic chromosomes. And so, you know, this is sort of allows the purge of harmful alleles that might be uh, fixed under Muller's ratchet, but at the same time, that sexual uh, reproduction does this, it allows, also allows this. It allows what I you know, can consider the exploitation uh, by harmful selfish elements. And typically in my world, when I talk about harmful selfish elements, I'm talking about transposable elements. And the reason it can be exploited is because through the fertilization event, through syngamy, that allows um, agents that are able to jump or whatever from one chromosome to another to sort of colonize other new genomes. And if the rate of uh, proliferation is higher than the rate that they harm, they can spread in populations. So it's sort of an irony that I consider. Now, because of this, I think it's important to consider the ways in which meiosis and sexual recombination are shaped by this actual conflict. And what I'm going to highlight are sort of two aspects of this conflict that I think are important to think about when understanding how meiosis and recombination and the machinery of meiosis and recombination are structured uh, within populations, within species. Okay? And there are sort of two primary challenges that I can consider uh, interesting, but there are a lot of other ones. And one of those, of course, is the challenge of pairing. Okay? In order to make sure that your chromosomes segregate properly, you have to pair them up. In the words of uh, Scott Hawley, match them, lock them, and move them. And what the thing is, though, when you have these dispersed repeated sequences, such as transpose moments, it's an interesting thing to think about. How do these dispersed sequences potentially foul up the ability to properly pair your chromosomes? And so I'll spend a little bit of time talking about some work that I did in Scott Hawley's lab discussing um, some interesting questions about this problem of pairing in the face of these dispersed repetitive sequences. And what, when I entered his lab, one of the things that I found very kind of confusing was work that he has done in his lab through, o over the years has shown a lot of different interesting things that heterochromatic and centromeric pairing is important for facilitating segregation and synapsis, especially in the, in the absence of crossovers, okay? So without crossovers in flies, it's very important for heterochromatic regions to pair with one another. Um, some recent work has also shown that centromeric clustering is also very important. But we also know that transposable element, uh, transpose elements are dominant constituents of heterochromatin. So there's sort of, sort of a, 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 a confusion there because how could these dispersed sequences be important for pairing itself? And another thing that's also interesting that I found is that this sort of third thing, which has been, um, been more and more fleshed out over the past uh, five or so years, is that the pyrene machinery, the, the silencing machinery that's active within the germline that recognizes aberrant transpose elements and puts them into peewee proteins and uses those small RNAs to target and destroy other transpose elements derived from those homologous sequences in the genome, is also involved in targeting Ts, of course, but is also involved in heterochromatin formation, although that latter point is still a little bit unclear in flies. Fi furthermore, work by others um, <clears throat> has shown that these pairing events between long distance regulatory sequences can be mediated by the pyrene machinery itself. So for example, looking at um, regulatory a sequence called the FabX uh, region, <clears throat> What you can do is, what has been done by uh, Grimaud and others, is that was doing using fish and somatic tissues, one can find that these regulatory sequences between scalloped and this other motif are clustered within the somatic tissues, but in flies that are defective for the pyrene machinery, those clustering events are disassociated, okay? And that has led to a model in which, and it's, the mechanism is not entirely clear, but by which these pyrene machinery, maybe not necessarily through sequence homology, but seem to play a role in clustering these sequences. So what that leads to is to propose a potential model that is also a model that would be hard to actually reconcile with how meiosis could proceed. And a model one could propose for how these 
repetitive heterochromatic sequences might be playing a role in pairing would be to propose, for example, that, for example, in interspersed repeat sequences or inter intercalary heterochromatin, typically transposable elements that are generating these small pyRNAs, they would be allowed to capture in trans the homologous chromosome by targeting nascent transcripts from the other homolog. Okay, so this is a sort of one model one could propose for how these heterochromatic sequences might play a role in pairing and that might depend on the pyRNA machinery, but it's also a kind of a strange model because how would one reconcile a model like this with the fact that there would be all these dispersed sequences? This seems like a horrible way to pair your chromosomes. So these different points of disjoint data led me to want to test whether the pyRNA machinery in fact did play a role in chromosome pairing. What I did is using FISH and I used heterochromatic sequences, I used a uh, histone cluster probe and also euchromatic sequences looking in meiotic cells as well as in somatic cells of embryos whose mothers were defective for the pyRNA machinery. I look at chromosome pairing. And <clears throat> the reason I looked in embryos is it's in flies, that's when somatic chromosome pairing is established early in embryogenesis. And what I found is in fact, the pyRNA machinery does not play any role. So it was a negative result, but it was a negative result that helped me sort of refine sort of an understanding of this confusing bits of different data that were disparate and led to a kind of a confusing model. So, these are the dodeca sequences, these are histone clusters, these are region 25, it's, a, it's a euchromatic sequences. These are in meiotic nuclei. And if you look at the distribution of distances in aubergine defective uh, aubergine flies, which is a very important component of the pioneer machinery and also the one that mediates that, those long distance pairing between those regulatory sequences, you see no dis difference in the distribution here, here, and here. Um, in those flies. And in addition, if you look in embryos of mothers defective for the pyRNA machinery, as well as actually we looked at Dicer mutants and Argonaut mutants, you find that with, with the histone cluster and the dodeca cluster, I couldn't look at um, euchromatic sequences because these flies don't progress beyond about three or four hours of age and that's when the euchromatic sequences pair in embryogenesis. But basically, if the mother is defective for peewee or, or aubergine and she doesn't load any of these proteins into her embryo, the chromosomes are able to pair normally. Now, these embryos are also really messed up, but that's another story for another day. Now, and I, I, I highlight this as, um, basically in the context of something that just come out like within the past couple months. Um, which was found in, at least in Pombe, and this is sort of the naive model I was sort of thinking about, this is the motivation for why I tested this um, a few years ago, in that in Pombe, it seems to me now clear that there are non-coding RNAs that in fact do play a role in pairing chromosomes. So this SME2 pairing site produces a non-coding RNA that's important in chromosome pairing, but there's a distinction here. And the distinction here is that this is a single copy sequence and these are repeated, repetitive sequences. So I like to sort of bring that story in to sort of tie it together and say, basically you can kind of think of their contrasting roles for non-coding RNA in meiotic pairing. One with single copies, which do seem to maybe play a, an important role in pairing, although more of that needs to be established. But with regard to transposable elements and pyRNAs, we can say that that would lead to probably meiotic chaos and that's not a good way to pair. And also it is in fact not the case that chromosomes pair that way. So, in terms of the, um, the way that meiosis works, another thing that I think is an important thing to think about is in terms of the uh, challenge of selfish repeats in meiosis is, is uh, ectopic exchange. And so what we have here is we have two chromosomes. These are the homologs and they're lined up. And there's our chromosome and there's a double strand of break and that leads to a chromosomal uh, rearrangement. And that can be very, very bad, okay? Now, in order to understand how these repeated sequences could be important uh, role, uh, could have an important role in causing chromosomal rearrangements, one needs to consider something important. And this is why I'm presenting this in a recombination meeting, is because there's something very important about how double stranded breaks resolve in meiosis that can lead to two different fates, okay? Well, we've already heard about you can have either a crossover, and this is obviously a very simplified version, or you can have a non-crossover, and of course in both cases getting gene conversion in the middle there. Now the reason this is important is because it's the crossovers, not the non-crossovers, that can cause chromosomal rearrangement. So I think there's something to be said for thinking about this choice between whether you do a crossover and whether you do a non-crossover 
and how that might play a role in these chromosomal rearrangements, which often can be resulted from repeat sequences. There are other further consequences, of course, for this decision because it's crossovers that ensure segregation for the most part. So looking at individuals that have uh, trisomy 21, if you look at individuals that um, have had a M1 segregation defect, you know, you find an excess of individuals that have 70% of those individuals would have zero crossovers on those chromosomes, whereas in normal you'd have about 52%. So of course, you don't always have to cross over to segregate chromosome 21 correctly, but it helps, okay? And another important thing is that um, crossovers and non-crossovers will affect linkage disequilibrium differently, and this was pointed out by Andofato and Nordborg uh, a bit ago. So if you look, for example, I mean, effectively, if you think about it, non-crossover gene conversions can just think of, as you can almost think of as double crossovers right next to each other, okay? So because of that, if you look here, what these are plots of sort of what is the signature of balancing selection that in regions where there's a, a fair amount of um, uh, non-crossover gene conversion, the signature of balancing selection will decay much more quickly than if you do not allow for non-crossover gene conversion. And that makes sense because it's essentially more crossovers are happening that uh, see, appear like doubles. And Langley, is also pointed, Langley and others have also shown that even in regions of the genome that do not have a lot of crossovers, you can still see a pretty good distance of, uh, pretty good decay of linkage disequilibrium, and that's presumably because of the non-crossover gene conversions that are happening in those parts of the genome. So, in light of these things, one of the things I'm trying to understand, as well as others, is what determines this crossover, non-crossover choice, and a lot of different things get into this choice, okay? One is, of course, gonna be the rate of double strand or break formation, interference, assurance, and finally, you can think more clearly about the stabilization of invading three prime ends may play a role in this decision to go in one way or the other. And of course, the machinery that Jeff Sikelsky um, was just talking about earlier is the sort of integrator of perhaps a lot of these different things to make this choice. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to basically distinguish non-crossovers from gene conversions from multiple crossovers. And what I mean by this is in, if you have hot spots, this is something that's been kind of keeping up uh, late at night every once in a while. So if you have hot spots, right, and over multiple generations, if you have a crossover in one generation, then a crossover in the other generation, you, it could look like a gene conversion. It's hard to distinguish those, and I've spent a little bit of time looking at uh, SNP data for that, and it was, it was very difficult for me to do that. Um, so what we would like to be able to do is do that. Now, in flies, there may not be hot spots, so maybe it's not a big deal, but I still fretted about it. Uh, another thing we'd like to know is what is the genome-wide rate of non-crossover gene conversion? And then finally, how does the distribution of single crossovers, double crossovers, which would interfere, show interference in non-crossover gene conversion events different? And are there genomic features that predict these different fates? And finally, all of these questions can be set out to sort of answer this final question is how is this crossover, non-crossover decision made? So the approach that we took um, was basically to sequence uh, recombinant uh, chromosomes that have gone through a single round of meiosis. And so there is a sort of an orthogonal approach that was discussed earlier, which is um, to do a lot of crossovers. And what we've done is tried to try the, uh, an orthogonal approach, which is you don't get very many crossovers when you do this, but you can kind of map them to high resolution to give you an idea of what's going on. And so the basic principle here is we took two different strains of flies, Cantoness and White 1118, make heterozygous mothers with those <coughs> And then crossed those to males, of course, and then collected uh, F1 male, uh, sorry, collected males of this nature, and then crossed these males to a, attached X stocks. And the reason for doing this is what we actually decided we weren't going to worry about the autosomes yet, because we didn't want to try to score gene conversions in, he in, uh, in heterozygous lines. So we just said, forget about the autosomes for now. We'll just do the X chromosome, because now we can at least score gene conversions as hemizygous states. And also, this allows us to freeze this X chromosome, because in, in a line in which you take this male and cross it with an attached X female, this male will just pass this chromosome off to all of his sons generation after generation. There's no crossing over in males, and also there'd be nothing to cross over with anyway since it's just a Y chromosome. So it's like a frozen single crossover, or maybe not, you'll see in a second, that a lot of times when you do this, when you sequence, we chose not to bias by selecting for crossovers because we just want the sort of basic distribution. You do a lot of sequencing and you throw out a lot of data, 
and actually is in fact you get like about you know as you would expect a lot of those chromosomes didn't show a single crossover and so we actually only you know as we expected in 30 chromosomes that we sequenced when we made those stocks of males we found 15 crossovers and so 18 of them were sort of zero crossovers and then there were nine singles and they're distributed in this fashion and there were three doubles okay and this is the uh, uh, crossover map the genetic map here as, as people know in flies is like a nice hump of cross uh, high recombination rate in the middle and you know we don't have you know, let's be honest we don't have a lot of data here to sort of say much about this so there's not this isn't going to tell us about hot spots at all but what it does tell us is a little bit that this seems to confirm at least be consistent with what we know to be the cross genetic map to look like so just an analysis of that the expected number of crossovers in the 66 megabase arm was 19 we found 15. The distribution of crossovers along the arm was, was as expected. The average span between doubles was 8.6 megabases, and the average pairwise distance between sing singles, okay, if you just do all the average pairwise differences, is 4.5 megabases. So that suggests that interference is basically distributing the doubles away from each other. But you, I didn't even try to do statistics on that. Um, what was what uh, the thing that we we're really after was the gene conversions okay and we got even fewer of those we only got five and so there's a temptation that we had to say oh this looks a little more uniform but I wouldn't necessarily uh, you know write home about that but I did tell you all about it so I don't know um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, concerned us was these what we would call the invisible gene conversions because the ability to sort of look at the gene conversions where they are and how long those tracks are is of course limited to the density of the SNPs that you have, right? If you don't have a very low density of SNPs, and flies are good for this because there's a lot of SNPs, but you still have this problem where you might have had what you could call, I mean, technically you wouldn't actually consider this as gene conversion because genetically nothing got converted, but there is a sort of track that would have been placed from here to here, but you can't see it because there's no SNPs. So we developed a model to deal with that which is a sort of a full likelihood of the entire data model where we basically said, okay, well, when you do have a gene conversion, let's say that there's a probability of some event, uh, we assume the Poisson distribution with lambda as a parameter, um, that there would be some double strand of break somewhere between here and here, and if it happened in there, you can say what's the probability of spread in one direction or this direction. If the double strand of break is here, you just say this, that it would have gone this far and minimally that far, and you can um, model the probability of spread on ways that others have already done. Chavnik and Sikelsi do this all the time, have done this in the past. Um, basically, a according to this model, where this, the probability of extending is uh, 1 minus probability uh, p, and then the probability that you stop extending is p. Okay. So you can do that for where you have a gene conversion, but the important thing is you use the data where you don't have gene conversions to estimate your rate of gene conversion. Okay, because these are all information about places where you don't necessarily think you saw a gene conversion, but you could have had one, but you didn't see it, okay, or there was one, but if there was one, you say, okay, well, what's the probability that it didn't spread uh, further than this or further than this? So when you do that, even with the five data points, you can come up sort of a, a joint distrib likelihood distribution for the uh, gene conversion rate and the tract length, okay? So this is a likelihood plot, and so right here is sort of the maximum likelihood estimate for the mean tract length, and then right there is the rate. And so we got about 1.8 times 10 to the minus 8 base pairs per meiosis, and then, so if you multiply that over the entire haploid genome, that gives about 2.14 uh, uh, gene conversions per haploid product, and there's four haploid products, so it gives about eight gene conversions per meiosis. And so coming from the meiosis, a single myocyte perspective, that gives us a gene conversion to crossover ratio of about 1.7 to 1. Now, this was more elegantly found out over years by Sikelsky and Chavnik groups, and so at this point, this is just basic confirmation that that work has verified that those numbers that others have estimated, our study for the, GC, the average tract length is 476 base pairs, for the rosy locus, 350 to 400. So it's basically about the same, and the gene conversion rate that we get on sort of a multiply the rate by the average tract length is about one times 10 to the minus fifth, and for the rosy locus, it's 1.3 times 10 to the minus fifth. So th at this point, this is basically just confirmatory, but it's good to know that data from the rosy locus is actually very applicable across the genome, at least as far as we can tell.
Finally, we, can, we are able to also reconcile this with um, double-stranded break numbers developed uh, that the McKim lab has done using standing for H2AV gamma. And if you, they're basically, you know, using that standing, you can look at the numbers of double-stranded breaks. And in repair mutants where these double-stranded breaks don't repair, you can count sort of in the life of a meiosis how many double-stranded breaks occur. And their estimates were of the order of 22 per myocyte. And so if we assume, um, we think a lot of non-crossovers uh, happen through this uh, SDSA pathway that was just discussed earlier by, uh, by Jeff Sikelsky, is that, you know, in this case, if you resolve that heteroduplex in one way, you'll get a gene conversion, but the other half of the way you will just convert back. And so you won't get a conversion. So if we just say, okay, well, half of the gene conversion events we don't even see, you can say that there's five crossovers per meiosis and there's twice that 8.6 number, so 17 gene conversions. So that gives us about 22, okay? Now obviously these are numbers that need to be fleshed out, but it's sort of at least confirming that we're on the right track. And it also suggests that there may not be, as we already know, a lot of exchange with the sister when you have a double-stranded break. But we kind of already knew that, okay. The motivation though for this in addition to estimating the genome uh, gene conversion rate, was to sort of look at features of crossover regions, okay? And so what these are is sort of the tract length. So, you know, sometimes you have a SNP here and a SNP here, so you don't have really good ability to, like, narrow it down. But within those crossover regions that one is able to narrow down, um, uh, a bioinformatician, Ariel Paulson, found a motif that was seemingly enriched within this, and this is what it looks like, okay? Um, so there's something maybe going on there with, that cro with the crossover regions. Now in addition, the X chromosome is about 24% 20, uh, exonic, and then these finely resolved COs span about 13,000 base pairs in sequence and basically only comprise 3.3% of exonic sequences and sort of doing a permutation test that is significant. So it seems in flies that they're avoiding the exons. And there's some data in, I think, humans and mice that support that. But I can't speak to this point that was brought up earlier about whether there's any sort of preference for near the transcription starts. Like, that's something we should look at. Now, what was interesting is that <clears throat> even though we have only five data points, it doesn't appear that these non-crossover gene conversion regions show either of these indicators. So this core motif, this GTGGAA, which is also comprised a little bit of GTGCAA and ATGGA, those three motifs, which are the most common contributors to that sort of meta motif, are three times more frequent in crossover regions rather than gene conversion regions, and that's significant by Fisher's exact. And in addition, of the five finely resolved gene conversions, they spanned about 22% exonic sequence versus 3.3 for the uh, for the uh, crossovers. So it seems that these gene conversion regions are, are, don't seem to have any preference against exonic sequences. And so these two points then can let us think that maybe it's something about DNA sequences with particular properties, whether it be something at the sequence level or epigenetic level, might lead to variation in heterodupex stability, which would influence this uh, crossover, non-crossover choice. Now, one thing that might be sort of confusing is, well, then how could this motif somehow explain the recombination map? And we don't think it does probably at all. And that's because this is a pretty simple motif, okay? And it's pretty broadly distributed across the entire chromosome, okay? So what explains the suppression of recombination uh, or crossing over um, out at the telomeres or at the centromeres is not sort of a lack of this particular motif out at those regions. So that has to be explained by something else. Probably what this motif is doing is something more fine scale, if it in fact is real. Now, one thing that we did notice is that if you look at the regions of the single crossovers, those finely resolved single crossovers, as well as distal crossovers right in this sort of region, of the distal double crossovers, okay, there is a pretty high motif count density in there. So 46 motif counts in about 7,000 nucleotides. But if you looked at all those, well, there's really only three. There's only three. You find that um, those double crossovers that are down here, sort of near the, the, uh, centric, the centromere, well, the motif density is a lot less. So that might be telling us something. And then, so you can kind of try to sort of reconcile a model that, and this is what we're trying to do now, is, and one could propose that 
These interfering crossovers, okay, that probably happen in the middle of the chromosome arm, arise from double stranded breaks in the middle of the arm and then get sort of localized better based on sort of uh, where the branch migration occurs to in regions of highest um, motif density, okay? And then there's going to be a residual class, okay, which would be these non-interfering ones, which all of the crossovers that end up over here, and the non-crossover gene conversions that sort of arise from these residual gene conversions that don't necessarily have this high uh, motif density. So using this, we kind of, we obviously have a few th things to do to test this, but this is our current working model. And to sort of leave you with this final question, which I didn't actually answer, but it's something interesting, is that in Drosophila, there's a tremendous variation in TE content. So here's melanogaster. In the euchromatin, about 6.3 megabases of euchromatin are comprised of TEs. But in like virilis, which is one of my favorite uh, Drosophilids, 24 megabases. And in Asi's got 43 megabases. It's interesting to think about because these crossovers can have important fates in making chromosomal rearrangements, how might this ratio of this crossover, non-crossover ratio change across evolution in the, in the light of this changing of uh, landscape of repeated sequences? Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, thank a lot of different people. Um, at the Stowers Institute, this is a work that kind of came out of a, uh, my, uh, my postdoc and extended since then. Um, Further, and the person who did a lot of the legwork who's actually here at this meeting is Danny Miller, and he actually was the one who sleuthed out all these gene conversions. There was a huge false positive rate. If we found 86 or so candidates, and only five of them were real. So that was actually a big part of this project, is finding the real ones. And Satomi and Kaiva we did all of the work, and the work was also supported by a lot of bioinformatics help at the Stowers Institute, and Bill Gailand was also a big contributor to this project. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions.